Big G. All right, D. How we doing? Old friend of Amen. Let's turn to number 453, please. 453. We're cutting in on our teacher's time. I don't know how to do that. Since it's been a couple of weeks, I just quickly go through where we got 
in this vision too, made it down to verse about 11. But what we've got here says, the angel that talked to me came again. Wake me up as a man is waking out of his sleep. So he's asleep, maybe because of the abundance of visions, like Daniel won't sleep in Daniel chapter 10 and verse 9. But this angel is back to wake him up and speak to him. And he said, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick or a lampstand, the Hebrew word is actually menorah of gold. Bowl upon the type of top of it, seven lamps thereon, seven pipes and seven lamps on the top thereof. So a very unusual looking lampstand that is supplied with a reservoir of olive oil coming from somewhere else, as we'll see in the next few verses. Our next verse, verse three, and two olive trees, one on the right side of the bowl and the other on the left side of the bowl. So I answered and spake the angel who taught me and said, What are these, my Lord? Now obviously he knew what they were literally. He'd just been told. Plus he already knew what a menorah looked like. And he certainly already knew what olive trees looked like living in Israel. So that's not what he means. What he means when he says, What are these? Is what are the what's the meaning? What's behind all this? What's this this prop this uh, vision about? So, verse 5, the angel that talked me answered and said, Knowest thou not what these be? In other words, he's amazed that uh, this prophet would not know what he's looking at because in his mind it should be self-evident what's going on here with this vision. And he said, No, my Lord. In other words, I don't have a clue what's going on here with this vision. So in verses 6 through 10, he begins sort of a general explanation of vision. The answer spoke to me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel. Remember, Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel was their governor. He was a descendant of the, of the house of David. And he says, Not by my, nor my power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Who art thou, O mountain, before Zerubbabel? In other words, there's a, some mountain standing in the way. Uh, some people turn molehills into mountains, some people turn mountains into molehills. Uh, but this mountain's in the way, he's going to flatten the mountain. He said, uh, the heads, uh, he shall bring forth the headstone thereof. We talked about that a couple, three weeks ago. How the headstone could be the final stone. It's also the word for the chief cornerstone, the first stone that's laid. But regardless, the point is, that uh, the foundation of the temple will be laid and the temple will be finished by Zerubbabel. So it says he shall break forth the heads on there with shouting, crying, grace, grace undead. Grace means the unmerited favor of God, right? In other words, what they're saying is we built this temple by God's power, by God's grace. This was not us. Grace means I didn't do it by myself. So like the story about the guy that it said he came along and he saw a turtle on top of a fence post. And the one thing he knew when he saw the turtle on top of the fence post was what? He didn't get there by himself. Somebody put him on top of that fence post. And any time the great things are called to the Lord, such as the rebuilding of the temple, by folks who did not have the time or resources to rebuild the temple, then obviously God had to be behind it. Especially with all the opposition that we read about the rebuilding of the entire land in books like Ezra and Nehemiah. Uh, all the forces around them did not want them to rebuild their wall or repopulate their city nor rebuild their temple. They tried their best to stop it by every means, legal and illegal. And you might say gray in the middle between the two. All right, so that's going to be rebuilt. Verse 8, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, The hand of the rope will lay the foundation of this house. His hand shall also finish it. And thou shalt know the Lord of hosts has sent me unto you. In other words, the same governor who started will be the same governor who finishes it. And in the ancient world especially, you know, when we elect a governor, we assume he's going to serve four years. Now, they don't always make it four years. They usually seem to make it four years in Georgia. Uh, other states, like New York, they may not make it six months before 
somebody stabs them in the back, or stabs somebody in the back and gets caught on camera, one or two. Uh, but we usually think about a four-year term. In the ancient world, not so. When somebody was appointed governor, you served at the the pleasure not of the people and not of the some constitution that told you how long you served. You served at the pleasure of the man who put you in the job. And uh, guess what governor's job were? Every one of them were in right to work states. In other words, they could fire you for being a governor just because they didn't like the way you look. And there was nothing illegal about it. And uh, these governors, oftentimes, when things would happen bad, somebody had to get the blame, and they were what we call middle management. So they got the blame. But he said this governor that started it would be the governor who finishes the job. In other words, it's not going to take an incredibly long time to rebuild the temple. And then when that happens, you'll know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto you. In other words, the rebuilding of the temple was something that by this time seemed unlikely. You remember they had laid the foundation of it in Ezra originally 16 years prior and then continued to run into obstacles or to set up their own obstacles, as Haggai talked about, dwelling in their own civil houses. In other words, they, instead of building a temple, they were building their own houses. But all of these oppositions and obstacles came up, and they weren't doing what they were supposed to do. And the Lord's house lied, as it were, in ruins. So uh, the idea is that, that uh, Zechariah is a prophet. And when he says it's going to be built, it will be built, and that will prove uh, that he is a prophet. So it had to be something unlikely to do to be that, to, to fit that situation. Because as we talked about last time, uh, one of the tests to see if someone was a true prophet was when he made a prediction, does his prediction come to pass? And Zechariah's prediction does come to pass here in verse 9, uh, the completion of the temple by Zerubbabel affirms that authority. Chapter 6 and verse 15, one page over in my Bible at least, is going to have the same concept. That they that are far off shall come and build in the temple of the Lord, and ye shall know the Lord of hosts has sent me unto you. And this shall come to pass if you were diligent, you'll obey the voice of the Lord. You'll know that I'm the Lord. Ezekiel has a lot to say about that. When this happens, you'll know I'm the Lord. Then in verse 10, For who hath despised the day of small things? They shall rejoice. In other words, the very ones that said this is not going to match up to the temple that Solomon built, they're going to be the ones who rejoice when they see the plummet and the hand of the rubble with the seven. And the seven are the eyes of the Lord that run to and fro over the whole earth. In other words, talking about God's omniscience and omnipresence. That God, nothing could escape God's gaze. And those all over the earth who are trying to oppose the building of the temple, he sees it and he's going to handle it. That gets us down to what we got to last time, which is verse 11. Verse 11, the second question of the prophet will be answered in verses 11 through 14. Here's what the text says. Then answered I and said unto him, what are these two olive trees on the right hand of the candlestick and on the left hand thereof? In other words, his original question was, what is this? And he began to explain to him the meaning of, of, of the fact that the rubble is going to rebuild the temple. But now he wants to know specifically about the olive trees on each side. Um, back that he asked about chapter 4, verse 4, earlier in the chapter. But before the angel can answer the first question, Zechariah adds in a second question on top of it. And, he, and I answered again and said, uh, What be these two olive branches that through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? In other words, this is what he really wants to know. In fact, it may be between 11 and 12 that there was a silent response. You ever hear of a silent response? You know, that's when somebody asks a question and you just look at them like, what? Are you really that stupid? Or, or 
Carl, what are you asking me? I don't really understand what you're asking me. So maybe he just refines the question. This is what I'm really asking about. Uh, he said, what would these two olive tree, olive branches? The word branches is used sometimes with ears of grain, for example, in the story of Joseph in uh, Genesis 41. Here it seems to be used of the branches of the olive trees being outstretched uh, to empty themselves in the golden pipes. Uh, the New King James is understandable here. Who's got the New King James? Somebody read verse 12 in New King James, if you got it. If not, I will grab one. I got the key. You got it? Go ahead, Cal. What's it say? In verse 12. Again, I ask him, what are these two olive branches beside the two golden pipes that pour out golden oil? What are these two olive branches beside the two golden pipes that pour out the golden oil? That's what's going on here. They drop down the olive into the pipe, which empty into the lamp. And of course, the point of the oil is to keep the lamp lighted. Uh, I don't know if the oil is golden in appearance or if you're just talking about the golden oil in the sense of it's that valuable. But the real point is that there is no human agency involved. Normally, to get oil from an olive tree to a lamp, a lot of human activity had to be involved. Somebody, as it were, I don't know if they would use the word reap, but I would. Somebody had to reap the oil, somebody had or olives, somebody had to press the olives, and you've got all the folks in the middle man that, that, that sell olive oil to the distributor, who sell it to the to the BJs that you buy the olive oil from or whatever, and then you take it. I mean, there's a lot of human agency. But in this case, there's no help from any humans. Who made the olive tree? God. And it just pumps the oil straight into the into the uh, lampstand, and that lights up what we're getting going on. Yes, sir. The American Standard Version says, what are these two olive branches which are beside the two golden sprouts? Yeah. I, I didn't like the sprouts in there, but I like the olive branches. Sprouts is just the word. When I think sprout, I don't think of anything but what? The little dude with God, Jolly Green Jack. That don't help me understand anything. It just confuses me. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so the point is, again, there is no human agency. This is automatic oil that is illuminating. And of course, God, that's what he does is illuminate, right? And verse 13, he answered and said to me, Knowest thou not what these be? Now to the angel, he's already explained the vision in 6 through 10. And again, he says what? No, my Lord. And again, we're glad he says, No, my Lord, because I didn't understand it either. So I need some more explanation. Verse 14, here he's, he's really at the end of his road. Then said he, These... These two prominent branches coming out of the tops of the olive trees are the two anointed ones. Now we know from the Old Testament that two of the offices at least that were anointed is, for example, somebody look at Leviticus 8.30. Brother Bill, you read 1 Kings 10.1 to us. Leviticus 8.30 and 1 Kings 10.1. That's it. Kings. First uh, Samuel ten one. First Samuel ten one. Leviticus eight thirty. And Moses took of the anointing oil and of the blood which was upon the altar and sprinkled it upon Abel. On his garment, on his son, on his son's garment, with him, sanctified Abraham and his garment, and his son, and his son's garment, with him. All right, so Aaron and his sons constituted back in Leviticus what? Priest. The priest. So the priests were people who were anointed. 
All right, what we got will be in the first Samuel 10 1. Then Samuel took the flask of oil, poured it on his head, kissed him, and said, Has not the Lord anointed you a ruler over his inheritance? All right, a ruler over his inheritance. Who's, who is Samuel anointed there? Saul. Saul. Saul, the first king, the ruler of Israel. So we've got priests who are anointed, and we also have kings who are anointed. So here, it seems as if he's referring apparently to two, two offices. One of those offices would be the civil rule. One of those offices would have to do with the religious rule. And thus far, if we were to look in their day, we would think, in our mind, he's talking about two offices. He's talking about Zerubbabel, the political ruler, and he's talking about Joshua, who was the high priest. But here's the beautiful thing about God's work. As Isaiah said, it's here a little, there a little. In other words, God is progressively revealing through his revelation what he intends to do. He says, for example, in Genesis 3.15, that the seed of woman would crush Satan's head. Now we know from Romans in the New Testament that refers to Christ. However, which, which seed of which woman? There's going to be a lot of women born because Eve is called the mother of how many of the living? All living. So everybody descended from Eve. That don't really tell us a lot. But in Genesis 12, progressive revelation comes in and says, Abraham, it's your seed that's going to bless the entire earth. So when that happens, that narrows the focus, if you will. And we're going through this telescope and getting closer to a, at least a magnifying glass, maybe. Yes, sir. When I look back at verse 10 of the Quran 4, mm -hmm. it talks about the chief Christ is going to be the chief one. So, yes. And he holds both offices, priests, and That's priests. where we're going. Please slow down. <laughs> we, we get there. I already started with the impression of Satan's hand. We just got to get there. Yeah. I know. He, he needs to go back. <laughs> get that tooth down his soul so he can't talk. Maybe I don't know. Uh, anyway, so Calvin's already given it away. But we're in Genesis 12, we're narrowing down to the family of Abraham, but that is not enough. He's not just going to be the family of Abraham, for you remember that Abraham has two sons, Ishmael and Isaac. Isaac is going to be the one through whom God says, Through him shall a nation of earth be blessed. Even though God, Abraham said, Oh, Ishmael might ever live before. And God says he's not the one, it's Isaac. Then all the way down to the, to, to the 12 tribes, when Jacob had his name changed to Israel, but that descendant is not going to come from just any of the tribes. At the end of his life, Jacob was sitting like leaning on his staff and blessing his children. And he puts a prophecy out about Judah. He says, Judah is like a lion. And he, he makes the prophecy that this is going to be the one through whom the seed promise will come physically. That continues on. We get to Matthew, we see it narrowed all the way down. Isaiah narrows it to a virgin conceiving. That's pretty rare. Right? So finally we find out from Matthew 123 that his name is Jesus the Christ. So we found all that out. Now, again, what's going on here? We're still in the Old Testament what Augustine called the moonlight age. By the moonlight, you can see things, but you can't see clearly like you can in the sunlight. So in this moonlight age, it appears that we're talking about two lampstands being two distinct olive trees bringing the blessings in. But what we're going to find out even before we get out of the book of Zechariah, to find out that those two representatives are going to be important and they're going to be united in one. Uh, 
Remember, Zerubbabel, look at two places. Look at 1 Chronicles 3.17. 3.17. bodily, literally, 
in a body with bodily means. All of that dwells in one body. So that's what's going on back here in Zechariah. That, that telescope has suddenly become a microscope and focuses in on that being who will do the job. But here's the most beautiful thing. Not only is he king, prophet, and priest, but he is also sacrificed, as we learn from the book of Hebrews. And he's a sacrifice who didn't need to sacrifice for himself. Why? Because he was sinless. Unlike the priest who had to sacrifice for themselves before they could ever get around to sacrifice for people. What a picture we have that continues to unfold in the Old Testament, and we're right in the middle of it, Zechariah, where we are. What a great picture. These two anointed ones, uh, the text tells me here in verse 14, stand where? By the Lord. By the Lord of the whole earth. These two are one. And they stand by the Lord. Ultimately, the reason I say, what does it say here? That he will sit upon his throne, rule upon his throne, preach on the throne. But he shall, verse 13 of chapter 6, build the temple of the Lord. Let me show you that. Somebody look at Amos 9, 11 through 12. Temple of Amos 9, 11 through 12 tells us. In that day, I will raise up the fallen booth of David. You said 11? Yeah, 11 and 12. And wall up his breaches. I will also raise up his ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old. Okay. That they may possess the remnant of Eden, all the nations who were called by my name to the Lord of the justice. Okay. So we've got a prophecy in Amos here. That in that day, and we've heard that day phrased often in the Old Testament, referring to the time of the Messiah. But in that day, God is going to raise up something that you remember said it calls the booth of David. We know the feast of booths is the feast of what? Which feast is that? The feast of tabernacles. What does the feast of tabernacles commemorate? When the children of Israel left the land. So fast that they dwell in tents. Now you remember in 2 Samuel 7, when David writes, because that's where a booth or a tabernacle is, is a tent. So in 2 Samuel 7, David, when he appeals and he wants to build a temple, a permanent place for the Lord to dwell, he says, Why is it that, right now, Antoine, I'm passing the bachelor of missionaries overseas, that part of a general collection, but a special collection, taking up for them. But David says in 2 Samuel 7, Nathan the prophet, I've got, a, I've got a palace to dwell in. Why is it fitting that the Ark of the Covenant, which symbolizes the very presence of God, dwells in tents? That's how he characterizes the tabernacle. As great as the building of the tabernacle was under Moses, and you remember they donated and donated and donated, and finally Moses said, we got so much we can't take no more. As great as that tabernacle was, David saw it as something so inferior that God should not be dwelling there. So he wants to build a temple. And that temple takes the place of the tabernacle. And that temple, you remember, David was not able to build it, even though Nathan originally said, that's a great idea, go for it. God stops him on the way back, sends him back in, and says, you go tell him what my message is. You're not going to build your son is. But here's what you can do. You can be the one through whom Messiah comes with a great blessing. And two, you can be the one who prepares for the building of the temple. So he makes the covenants with Hiram and all the rest of it. We're ready to build the temple. So that's what David did. But here in Amos, it's called the tabernacle of David. Now wait a minute. That's the tabernacle of Moses. Why is he called the tabernacle of David? Because he's referring to that transition time when the tabernacle becomes the temple. As David prepared the way for the Lord there. 
Now turn with me to the most important text dealing with Amos 9, Acts 15, 15 through 18. And let's see if we recognize this, this message here. Here's Peter. And here's the good thing. Peter is standing up and he's having this big, big fight in the church of Jerusalem over should Jews, should Gentiles have to become Jews first before they can become Christians. And listen to what he said. In the midst of this discussion between James and Peter in Acts 15, what does it say there? With this, the words of the prophet agree. Come on, let's go back to 10, baby. Let's see who's speaking. It's James, right? Okay. In verse 10, James is speaking. So James is agreeing with Peter, even though we're going to read Galatians 2 that the reason Barnabas got carried away with an ox tree and pretended like the, Jew, the Gentiles were second-class citizens in the kingdom is because certain came from James. But in Acts 15, Luke's account, James is saying, I'm in agreement with this. Go ahead, Brother Bill. After they had stopped speaking, James answered, saying, Brother, listen to me. Simeon, you want to start first? Yes, you yeah. get Simeon is Peter. Simeon is his, his Jewish name. Yes, right. Go ahead. Saying, Brother, listen to me. Simeon, as related, how God first concerned himself about taking from among the Gentiles a people for his name. Now we pause you for a second. That's Pete, that Simeon is referring to what Peter has already said, where Peter went back and recounted what happened in Acts 10 and Acts 11 at the house of Cornelius, how the first Gentile convert came to the church because God sent the Holy Spirit upon him and said, If I have cleansed him, you don't call it common or cleansed away. With this, the words of the prophet agree, just as it is written, after these things I will return, and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen. All right. And I will rebuild its ruins, and I will restore it. Okay. So he's referring, James, is re the brother of our Lord, is referring to Amos and the prophet we just read, and say that was fulfilled with what Peter did in bringing Gentiles into what? The church. Because the church is taking the place of the tabernacle of David, a.k.a. the temple. Because the church is God's temple here on earth now. The church is the place where God dwells. He does not anymore need uh, a house to dwell in because he dwells in his house which is the church 1 Timothy 3 and verse 15 if thou tarriest long and if thou mayest know how thou always behave thyself in the house of God which is the church of God the pillar and ground of the truth so that's what Zechariah is talking about that's what Amos is talking about when Jesus is rebuilding the temple of the Lord or the tabernacle of David, same place. What he is building is the same thing he promised to build in Matthew 16, 16 through 18, when he said, I will build my church. That is the place that God intended to be built from the beginning. So, meanwhile, back in Zechariah, finishing up this chapter, uh, these two are one. The one that does the rebuilding, of course, is the Messiah because he is both priest and king. And that's what we're learning here in verse 14. These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. So these two become one, which is Christ. And it's Christ that provides the oil that is the light that illuminates the church. Remember what Jesus said about the church. He said, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. He talked earlier in that Sermon on the Mount about the fact that we're supposed to be candles, if you will, if you will and that we should let our light so shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify who? Uh -huh. The Father which is in heaven. That's our job as the church. We're to be that light. But who, who, who supplies the oil for that light? 
God. That's why they glorify God when they see the light. Because we didn't do it on our own. Again, we've got the olive branch, which is Christ, supplying the oil, and that's what lights us up. The oil is the essential part of that transaction. We're merely instruments. The lamp's nothing without oil, is it? And, and without the olive tree, you can't get the oil of the lamp. And this is all, again, done by a human agency. What a wonderful picture he's painting for us here. Any questions about chapter 4? I'm going to show you what we're going to do in chapter 5. We'll get there this week. But I'll, I'll, let me just read you the first four verses. Set it up. I turned. Excuse me, verse chapter 5, and 6. Then I turned, lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a flying roll. Now, again, when I hear flying roll, you know what I think about? A place called Lambert's Cafe in Foley, Alabama, where they throw the rolls at you, you catch them, and you eat them. They're very good. He's not talking about that kind of roll. What he is talking about is about a flying scroll. As you'll see in Revelation about that scroll. But anyway, he said to me, what seest thou? He answers that I see a flying scroll. The length is 20 cubits and the breadth 10 cubits there. That mean, I just preview it. There's two things that he knows about the scroll. Just seeing a scroll is not amazing. They were common. But what he sees, number one, is it's flying. Scrolls normally don't fly. Turns out they normally just lay there on a pulpit when somebody unfolds them. They don't fly. But number two, when he talks about the size, they might be the length of this scroll, which would be rare. That's a long scroll. But we're, we're, we've got, for example, the Isaiah scroll that was found in one of the Dead Sea Scrolls was about this long. But scrolls are never this wide. Scrolls normally were between 7 to 10 inches wide. Well, we're 15 feet wide. Meaning 15 times the normal width of a scroll. We're billboard size as it were with this scroll. So it's a flying scroll, but it's a giant flying scroll that he sees. Then he said to me, this is the curse that goeth forth over the face of the whole earth. For everyone that, that stealeth should be cut off as on this side according to it. Everyone that swears should be cut off as on the other side according to it. So this scroll contains a message of cursings for those that violate something. And if you want to talk about what do they violate, you got to remember what was it the Old Testament that says don't steal and don't swear falsely in the name of God. That is the Decalogue. And you remember it was written on two tables, tables of stone. And you remember the first half of those tables of stone dealt with man's relationship with God. The second table dealt with man's relationship with man. But then that, that Decalogue was expanded in the whole Old Testament, which told the story of man's relationship with God and man's relationship with man. And how the man, if he violates that according to the book of Deuteronomy, he'll be cursed. And that curse that happens is a curse that is punishment for violation of God's covenant that he made with his people. Uh, so what's the result of that? As a result of the curse, everyone that violates that will be cut off. And he said, I will bring, bring forth, say the Lord of hosts, and enter into the house of the thief, and the house of the man that swears falsely by my name. That's why I'm saying that. I, I know what it said up there. It just says, uh, swear it. But the divine commentary below says, swear it falsely by my name, which is why I tied into the first half of the deck lot. It shall remain in the midst of his house and consume it with the temple thereof and the stones thereof. In other words, that scroll represents the curse and that curse is going to be brought on that man's house that violates God's covenant and he will be destroyed. Now, this word translated scroll, we're going to look at the text 
But there's three texts in the Old Testament that use this Hebrew word other than our text here. One of those texts is Jeremiah 36. We're going to spend a little bit of time looking at that. One of those texts is Ezekiel 2 and Ezekiel 3. The third text is in the Psalms, and that's Psalm chapter 40 and verse 7. That's the only time this word translated by the King James here role is used. And, and it refers, but we'll see what it refers to next week. And why that's so important for us and what it does to the people of God in that century. And what that same scroll will do to us if we violate the same message. So we'll pick it up more with it next time in chapter 5. I you know, just want to introduce it because we already had that fail before we started. Thanks. All right, good morning, church. Uh, welcome to the worship services of the Arlington Church of Christ, where God is spirit. Those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Uh, for folks who are in our audience at the time before we start our worship service, if you would check your cell phones and electronic devices to make sure that they are off, silent, mute, or on vibrate at this time as we continue to prepare hearts and minds for worship on this morning. Uh, once again, I want to wish a good morning to those of you who are viewing our worship service on audio and visual platforms at theallertonchurchofchrist.com and also on sermon.net or listening via phone at 904-593-2210. Once again, we thank you for worshiping up this morning and making it a top priority to continue to worship in God in spirit and in truth on this Lord's Day. Also, our members online, don't forget we'll be here at the building today to uh, collect your offering if you need to drop that off or need to pick up any communion packets. Um, they'll be available as well. And also, if you need to um, have a prayer request or concern, please text or, or email those in at 904, text at 904 904-351-8209 or email them at prayers at arlingtonchurchofchrist.com so our elders at the appropriate time can uh, read your prayer requests and pray on your behalf. So if you would do that for us, that would be greatly appreciated as well. Um, our brothers who are serving this morning, our song leader, of course, our brother Chris Naducci, um, our scripture reader, brother Antoine Jones, my speaker out will be our elder brother A.C. Sanders, and also presiding at the Lord's table and giving will be our deacon, uh, brother Ronnie Powell. Pray with me, please. Dear most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, once again, we humbly come before you. Thank you for waking us up with life, good portion, health, and strength, and closing our right minds once again to come out to worship you in spirit and in truth, Heavenly Father. As we prepare our hearts and minds, we continue to cast our cares and concerns upon you with all the distractions of this life and all the different uh, issues that's going on in this world, Heavenly Father. We pray that we continue to help us to keep our focus on you as we give worship to you on this morning, that everything that we say, do, and think will be pleasing and accepting in your sight, Heavenly Father. Pray for those who are still in route to the building. We pray for that safe travels here. We pray for those who are away from us at this time, those on our platform. Once again, we thank you for them as well. Any visitors that we have, we thank you for them as well, um, worshiping us on this morning. As always, we pray for our sick and shut-in of our congregation, those who are dealing with different uh, health concerns and issues that we uh, see and read about in our bulletins and uh, that have submitted prayer requests. We continue to ask that you continue to watch over them and heal their bodies and help them to continue to keep the faith as they trust in you despite their ailments that they're going through. Pray for our spiritual sick of our congregation, those who left in air from the faith. We pray that you grant them the time and space to come on before it's everlasting too late. And always help us to continue to reach out to them, to let them know that we love them and we care about them and want them to come home before it's everlasting too late. As always, we pray for our college students, um, our young professionals, of our uh, first responders, our military personnel who are away from family at this time. Continue to watch over them and keep them, help them to be an example to, uh, as a Christian to a, a dying world, Heavenly Father, that they may continue to uh, do those things that are pleasing your sight and continue to be with them and watch over them as well. At this time, as we prepare for worship once again, we pray that we do those things that are pleasing your sight and according to your word, Heavenly Father, without any additional subtraction. We pray for Brother A.C. as he prepares his heart and mind once again to preach your word. Once again, uh, help us to help him to continue to uh, bring back all those things that he studied that he may uh, continue to speak boldly for you and help us to have a ready mind for those things that according to your word that we may apply to hearts and minds and as always go share with a dying word, Heavenly Father. Continue to watch over and keep us as always. Please forgive us of our sins. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Let's warm up my vocal cards by
God has been so good to us. We praise Him, we honor Him, we want to do our very best to serve Him. This morning I have a, a lesson that I want to share with you. Also on tonight, one of the uh, things that we've done, it's a rare thing since the pandem pandemic hit, that uh, we get a chance to uh, preach two sermons uh, back to back like we used to. And I always enjoyed the opportunity to come up on my AM session and tell you what I'm gonna do for our PM session, which will be after our snack on today. And the title of the lesson for uh, the PM is, Is There a Mouse in the House? Is there a mouse in the house? But for this lesson that I want to share with you on this morning, it's a very, very important lesson. And I have specific goals uh, in mind uh, for this lesson on this morning. You see, I, I really try not to make lessons about uh, myself. I really work hard at that, but I could not escape it on this, uh, on this occasion here. Uh, so I'm going to let you know that um, uh, I will be sharing some things with you uh, uh, about myself and hope that it will help you as well. The second thing is uh, I'm a very emotional person. I, I, um, it doesn't take very much to see how I'm feeling about things. I guess I would have made a very poor poker player, but that's all right because I don't play poker. Um, uh, it's easy to see uh, what I think about anything because I will, I will basically tell you uh, just in my expression. So my goal is this morning, as much as in me, is I like to remove that and just speak to you plainly this morning because I don't want anyone to miss what I have to say this morning because it is very, very important what I need to share with you on this morning. So I'm hoping and praying uh, that I'll be able to restrain and discipline myself uh, to keep all expressions away because it's not about that. The message is just that important that I want you to hopefully receive uh, on this morning. The title of our lesson on this morning is The Watchman Must Warn. The Watchman Must Warn. You see, a watchman is a person who keeps watch or guards against perils. A warning is an act of mercy shown by someone who does not want to see others experience the suffering that is certain to be brought on by our choices. The watchman must warn. I want you to join me this morning at 1 Timothy chapter 3. We'll start there as we uh, lay the foundation for this lesson uh, on this morning. 1 Timothy chapter 3, and I want to read the first seven verses of this very important uh, part of the Bible. The whole Bible is important. This one is important because it speaks to what God wants, what God expects. 1 Timothy chapter 3, starting at the first verse, the Bible says, This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. The first seven verses of 1 Timothy chapter 3 gives the qualifications of an elder, a bishop, a pastor, a presbyter, an overseer, a shepherd. All those terms making reference to that same office. 
You see, when the Bible gives the qualifications of this position, either a man measure up to it or he does not. If he does not, he has no business in this position. But if he does measure up, then there's an expectation, I believe, that God will want that man to serve if he qualifies. But don't forget, the first qualification of that is he must desire the work. He must desire the work. That's the first qualification. So when you look at these qualifications that is given to this man to serve this office, I don't need to tell you that you just don't, you know, you can't pick elders up off trees. It's a very difficult thing to accomplish, to have all those things lined up. And through the course of time, there have been good men who have served in this position who've had to step away for various reasons. Something went wrong with the family, whatever the case may be. Maybe he lost his desire, I don't know. But there are times when a man cannot serve in this position and have had to give it up for whatever reason that it can be. The point I'm making is, when you qualify for this position and you have a man who is willing to serve, if for any reason those qualifications aren't met, you are obligated to come and to question that man's position. You have a right to do that. That is your duty. That is your duty to those who will lead you. Either the man qualifies or he doesn't. And if there's a reason that he doesn't qualify, you need to carry out your duty to find out what the problem is and to get it addressed. But if the man does qualify, I see no reason why that you want to create a problem seeing that it is so hard to find qualified men to serve in this capacity. That's the office, you see, of an elder. He has a duty to the flock or the members to make sure all those things that I just read to you are met. He must be all those things, not most of them. He must be all of those things, or he does not qualify. One thing can eliminate him on that list. That is the duty that the man has to the flock that he is to oversee. Now drop down with me, if you will, to chapter 5, same book, 1 Timothy chapter 5. And I'm going to start reading at verse number 17. And we're going to find that there are some duties that the flock or the members have to the elders. The Bible says at 1 Timothy chapter 5, starting at the 17th verse, it says, let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox while it uh, treads out the grain, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses. Those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all that the rest also may fear. I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that you observe these things without prejudice, doing nothing with partiality. The Bible says at verse number 22, do not lay hands on anyone hastily, nor share in other people's sins. Keep yourself pure. These are the duties that the members have to the elders. You see, everybody has duties that they need to perform. God expects us to behave a certain way, both from the eldership and the fellowship. These are the things that we need to share. Now, I had mentioned to you earlier that I needed to get uh, personal with you so that you can understand, and I believe it will help you. When I look back on my life, I want to take you back to 1998. 1998 was a very, very pivotal point in my life. You see, in 1998, I was 12 years into my marriage. I was 37 years old, a fresh 37, one month removed from being 36, very young man. I had two daughters in the first and second grades. 
I was hired as a new agent for Nationwide Insurance, one of the net agents, 100 nationwide. Brother Chris, my good friend Chris, was his first year in the United States. He came, the plan was he was going to live with us for a while. We were building a new house, the house that we live in presently, sold the first house that we had all within that month. My mother had a major stroke. She had to come and live with us. I remember my new manager at the time when I met with him. After I was hired, the plan was that I was going to start November 1. But on my way to the office to see him that day, by the time I got there, he said, I got news for you. You will not be starting November 1. You will be starting September 1. It was late August when he told me that. And I remember when he said that because I was so taken back because it was enormous what I was doing. I knew it was critical for me and my family. I remember when he said that, it as if my heart skipped a beat because I was taken back. Well, after I left that meeting, my heart continued to skip a beat. And it wouldn't get right. When I got away, I waited a day or two, I was able to look at my shirt, dress shirt at the time, just like this one, and I could see my heart just pumping through my shirt. I said, this is not good. Finally, after a day or so, I went to my wife. I showed her. I said, Michelle, look at this. She looked, and sure enough, it was doing the same thing. She said, that cannot be good. You need to go to the doctor. So we did. We went to the doctor and uh, began to explain, at least I did, and I explained to the doctor everything that was happened to me in 1998. And I told the doctor, I said, you know, I think this is stress-related. I just have too much on my plate. You see, that's one of my many flaws that I have. You know, I'm self-diagnosing myself. When I should be listening, I was talking. That's one of the flaws that I have. And I went through that process and said, you know, it's probably this, but all that I have going on. She said, no, I don't think so. Let's get an EKG, and we'll find out what's going on with your heart. Sure enough, when she came back with the uh, printout, she said, your heart is out of rhythm. Uh, you are afibrillation, afib, and uh, that's a problem. She said, we're going to try to treat it with these uh, medications. Let's see how, how it does. A month or two went by. It didn't work. Church, for the first time, the first time, they introduced to me the cardioversion. And the cardioversion is this process. They stop the heart, and they restart it. So that's what I was going under. And uh, that was to get me back into rhythm. Well, after that happened, looking at my situation, I said, this is not good. Uh, the future, you see, uh, could be very short for me. I said, here's what I'm going to do. I have to protect my family. Let me go to my company and let me apply for some more insurance. I did, and I applied, came back nationwide flat rejected me. We will not insure you. I said, what do you mean you will not insure me? She said, here's what we'll do. Underwriting told me this. Let me send you your report, and I suggest you go talk to your doctor. Michelle and I did. And when we took it to the doctor to look at it, he looked at it, he said, you know, I didn't write this up, my partner did, and I wish he wouldn't do it that way. I would have done it differently, but here's the reality of what you have. You're a very young man, but you have a sick heart. And you're going to be a heart patient for the rest of your life. That's your reality. So we went and left that. I uh, said to Nationwide, I said, Nationwide, I come to you in need. You're asking me to sell products to people who are supposed to be in need. Here I am in a need, and I'm telling you I need insurance to protect my family, and you have rejected me. Well, they took it up the ladder, and Nationwide came back with this. I never forget. I never forget the tone of it. They said, only because you are our agent, we're going to write this policy for you, and we're going to charge you this table. The higher the letter is, the more money you're going to pay. I've been paying for a life insurance that is a car note since I was 37 years old. But I got to have it. I have people depending on me. I got two young daughters, and now I have my mom. I got to make sure that I'm around 
And if I'm not around, I got to be able to take care of them. No, I didn't omit Michelle. Michelle would be all right without me, always have been. She's built that way. But those three need me. So I went about a year or so, and the heart was in and out. So they said, they said for the second time, we'll repeat this. And for the second time, I had a cardioversion. They stopped and restarted my heart. As time went on, I began to look at my situation. And I said, there is no promise for me in this future. I've heard what the doctors had to say. I've heard all the reporting. It's just not good. All I can do was go to God in prayer and say, God, hear me, please. I said, Lord, I have two young children, and I got a mom that's dependent on me. Lord, if you would, if you allow me just to get my daughters off and away, I'll be forever grateful to you. And Lord, let me take care of my mom because see, now she needs me like I needed her. Well, December 2012, my mother departed this life. When my mother departed this life, my girls was 21 and 20 years old. I turned to God and I said, God, thank you very much. Thank you. I prayed to you and you answered. I say, God, any day now, because you've answered my prayer, there's no guarantee for me. I know I'm just one heartbeat away with a sick heart. I know that. I say, Lord, thank you. Thank you for answering my prayer. God is so good, you know. King Hezekiah prayed to extend his life, did he not? You know your Bible. God gave me 15 more years. Church, I'm working on year number 24. God has been that good to me. And I committed to him way back, it will be 10 years in December when my mother passed away. Any day now, Lord, any day, I'm good. I'm good. You have been more than good to me. You have answered me through and through. Lord, I love you. Lord, there is nothing I will not do for you. You see, Lord, I love what you love. And I know what you love on this earth. You love your people. So help me, Lord, if I'm going to serve. Help me not to judge your people. Help me to see them as you see them. I don't care what is said, what is done to me. I don't care, Lord. Help me to do for them what you would do. I'm not worrying about being used. I'm not worrying about this or that. I don't care, God. Help me to take care of your people because I know you love them. And you know what? I love what you love because you've been so good to me. You gave me more than I even asked for. Any day, Lord. Any day. Because my girls don't need me no more. And my mother has gone on. Nobody needs me. I'm good, Lord any day. Every breath that I take since the day I buried my mother is a bonus to me. I'm grateful. I'm thankful. I live to serve you. My wife would tell you that everything that I do is based on Sunday and Wednesday. She knows if she wants me to go somewhere, she's already planning. If I don't have him back on Sunday or Wednesday, he ain't going. I don't take vacations. I don't want to be away from God's people. I'm grateful. As soon as I can get back, I'm back. Because I want to serve him to the very best of my ability. I can't help but thank God. If you'd asked me back in the late 90s, if, you thought, if I thought I'd live to see 60, there's a 50-50 chance I'd have probably told you no. I don't think I'll see it. God has been that good to me. What can I do but serve him? 2018, they had to move on from the cardio version because it wasn't working. And I had that big one. Y'all remember, some of y'all remember, you were there, you supported me, you supported my family, thank you, I love you so much for that. That was the big one. 
they went in and they had to do the big steal and do all that and it worked, it worked out, I'm still here. But you see, I already resolved in my mind many years ago, Lord, it don't matter. As long as I die in the Lord, I really don't care. Amen. I don't care. I'm good. I can't lose. I just want to be faithful. But while I'm on this earth, I'm going to do your will. And no man is going to stop me. I will fear nothing. I will, I'm not sitting there trying to tell you I'm not afraid. You know, that's not what I'm saying. When I sit down and see what God wants me to do, there is no stopping. I don't care what it is. I'm doing it. If I believe that's what God wants. So when we begin to look at what God has done for me, where God has brought me from, how he has blessed me tremendously over and over again in every part of my life. I'm grateful. I love what he loves, his people. His people are precious to him. And because of that, they're precious to me. My doctor told me, he said, young, he said, the only thing you got going for you is that you're young. I said, no, doctor, that ain't the only thing I got going for me. What I got going for me is that I serve God. You see, people say I'm living on borrowed time. I don't live on borrowed time because God don't borrow time. God owns time. And when he's ready for me, it'll be over. And I've been telling you for years, you ought to celebrate when I leave. Because many things told me I'm not even supposed to be here. I'm grateful. I'm grateful to God. When you look at that, uh, the, that list that we read of the duties of an elder, you walk away with many things and many roles. Uh, the description that I like best is shepherd. You see, a shepherd is special. A shepherd is, a, is, is one who guards who take care of the flock, who give his life for the flock, who has to give an answer for every one of the flock. You see, that is all encompassing to me. That's what I look for. I'm a shepherd. A shepherd protects and a shepherd warns. That's what he does. He has to keep the flock safe. And so when I look at being God's shepherd. I take it very seriously. It's my life. When my wife tells me people are just using you, I look at her and I laugh and say, so you, you have no idea. How can you use me? After what God has done for me. God will judge it. Let me go do his will. That's my job. Now I want you to join me in Ezekiel, chapters 3. Let's get to our text. I'm sharing this with you so you'll know. I don't want this to be about me, but I want you to know what really makes me tick. It ain't this pump that I'm pointing at. Ezekiel chapter 3, starting at the 16th verse, here's what the Bible says. Now it came to pass at the end of seven days that the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore hear the word from my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life. That same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will be required at your hand. Yet if you warn the wicked and, does, and he does not turn from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. Again, when a righteous man turns from his righteousness and commits iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, 
he shall die because you did not give him warning he shall die in his sin and his righteousness which he has done shall not be remembered but his blood I will require at your hand nevertheless if you warn the righteous man that the righteous should not sin and he does not sin he shall surely live because he took warning also you will have delivered your soul join me same book Ezekiel chapters 33 I want to read at the first verse Ezekiel chapter 33 Starting at the first verse, <clears throat> the Bible says, Again the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of your people, and say to them, When I bring the sword upon a land, and the people of the land take a man from their territory and make him their watchman, when he sees the sword coming upon the land, if he blows the trumpet and warns the people, then whoever hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning, if the sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be on his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet but did not take the warning. His blood shall be upon himself. But he who takes warning will save his life. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet, and the people are not warned, and the sword comes and takes any person from among them he is taken away in his iniquity but his blood I will require at the watchman's hand so you son of man I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel therefore you shall hear a word from my mouth and warn them for me when I say to the wicked O wicked man you shall surely die and you do not speak to warn the wicked from his way that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. Nevertheless, if you warn the wicked to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. Therefore you, O son of man, say to the house of Israel, thus you shall say, if our transgressions and our sins lie upon us and we pine away in them, how can we then live? Say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? Ezekiel was the watchman for Israel. Brother Bill and I currently are the watchmen for the Lord's church here at Arlington. The Bible says plainly, if we do not warn, the blood of those who would die in their sins, we would be held accountable for it. I want to go to heaven, don't you? When I read God's word, I don't have time to wonder about what people think of me. I don't have time to even worry about the consequences of it. His word is his word. And when I see a problem in the church, I better address it because if you die in your sin, God has said your blood is going to be required at my hand. I've long died to this world it really don't matter to me my goal is to make heaven my home and my goal is to do all that I can to make heaven your home so when you have in the body of Christ here at Arlington people going around starting petitions that's sin you are in sin because you have no scripture reference to do what you're doing. 
If you have a problem, if a man does not qualify, come see the man and talk it through. But to go back door and start petitions, to carry petitions, to ask people to sign petitions, you are in sin. If you are receiving calls about this same old stuff, you are in sin. If you're calling people and talking about this and continue to allow this, you are in sin. Hear the watchman. I'm sounding the trumpet. I don't want you to lose your soul. There is a way you have duty. You have a duty to come to the elders in a way, two or three witnesses, to talk about what it is that is troubling you so it can be resolved. If you have not done that, you are in sin. And I say that to you because I love you and I want you to be saved. I don't understand why you would run that risk. You would gamble your soul on things that you have not followed in the Bible to get your answer to. Brother Bill and I both are pretty dark-skinned men, and we have talked to you until we're blue in the face to tell you to come and to see us if you have a problem. Some have chosen not to do that. Now, I know everybody that I'm speaking to is not a part of this. You're the innocent. So heed the warning. If somebody approach you about signing some petition and undoing this eldership, that's sin. You see, I've been in tough situations before. I take no pleasure in having a conversation like this with you. I don't. But we are talking about our souls, brothers and sisters. If you got something more important than that, that's a problem. There is a way to address your concern and to go about doing it the way it's being done is wrong, it's sin. Now the reason that I wanted to keep all the emotion out and my face making and all of that stuff out because I don't want you to lose what I'm saying. I'm not angry at anybody. I'm not retaliating against anybody because you haven't done a thing to me. But Jesus, that's who you're hurting. When we can't be about our father's business and go out in this world and try to win souls, but we are stuck with trying to just, you know, under, undermine this, cut this down, do this, change that, that is not the work of the Lord. Those are people are perishing out there who do not know the truth. And they won't know until we tell them. But if we are behaving like we're behaving, the Lord's work is not being done. The devil is winning. That's unacceptable to the Lord. Now, I'm sure there may be discussions about me and how dare I, and some of you probably fix it so he was up there screaming and sweating. I promise I try not to do that today. I'm trying to be as straight faced with you as I possibly can because I love you. And what you're doing is wrong. It is sin. I told you over and over again, the day that I can't stand up in this pulpit and preach the whole counsel of God, I will take my seat. And it's not personal against me. He can't hurt me. No man can hurt me. I live on the wing of a prayer. Any day now, Lord, the Lord can call me home. The Lord didn't need to stop and restart my heart. He could have stopped it long ago. Didn't have to take me in my 30s. I didn't even have to know about it. Could have took me in my 20s. Could have took me when I was a teenager. It doesn't matter. I'm saying to you because I love you. And if this is speaking to you, stop it. With all the love in my heart, I'm telling you, please stop it. It is not right. Lest you go and you hope and pray that I'm wrong. 
But I don't want you to stand before God in that day and have this sin on your ledger. Because if you're anything like me, I got enough problems. I need all the grace and mercy I can get. I'm not trying to create any new. You see, I got this awesome responsibility that I choose to give an account for every soul that come my way. That's scary enough right there. I hope and pray that when my day come and I stand before God, I hope I don't have to answer a lot of questions because if I do, I know I'm in trouble. But I'm just a man. I make mistakes, I sin too. And all I know to do is to make it right with God. Brothers and sisters, if you are participating in that, please, for the love of God, stop it. It's wrong. It's wrong. You have not followed anything close to the Bible in addressing this situation. If you have a problem, you know yourself. You've heard over and over again, be it from here, uh, church meetings, if you got a problem, come see the elders. Well, you elders, you won't listen. How do you know? Did you come? Who told you that? How do you know that? Let me be clear. If you are participating in that, you are in sin. Hear from the watchmen who have long died to this world. Repent today. Stop it. Change it. Move on. God has the ability to stop any heart that he wants. Pray. If you don't like this leadership, pray to God. Ask God to change it. He's capable. He can do anything he want to do. Pray about that. But don't lose your soul following things like that. It's wrong. Were you here to watch me? Those of you, again, who are innocent, I'm sorry you have to hear this. But let the trumpet be sounded. Hear it. You stay clear of that. It's wrong. I don't know how to say it any more plainer than I'm saying it right now. Don't think you're fighting the elders lest you be fighting against God. God knows what he wants and he'll shape it the way he wants to shape it. Any day now, Lord. Take me out. Then you have no elders, new elders, whatever you want. But don't be like Abraham and Sarah. He don't, God doesn't need your help. He's fully capable of doing whatever he decides to do. With all the love in my heart, I say that. And you know, God has worked on me in a magnificent way because I truly hold no grudges against his people. I understand. And if you need me tomorrow in your heart of hearts, every one of you know I will be there because I don't serve man, I serve God. That's what he has shaped this little sick heart to be. I'm so grateful. And I know you are too. God has blessed so many of us in this congregation through and through. We're a little church that really sits on a hill. Who've done things other churches three, four times outside wish they could have done. The things that you have done 
both domestically, locally, as well as internationally. That's what we need to be about, our Father's business. I apologize that I can't come every time and have a lesson of encouragement or whatever, but you know, that's not teaching the whole counsel of God. My job is to warn, and the warning has been sounded out. Turn back to your first love. Serve God. Don't worry about that man, and don't worry about this man. You pray to God. Ask his will to be done. He'll fix it. And whatever it's going to be, it's going to be. To God be the glory. I'm so relieved. You know why I'm relieved? Because the blood, if a person die in iniquity, will not be on my hands. I've done what God asked me to do, and I pray that you'll do your part. God is so good and loved each and every one of us so much that he sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to down the cross for the sins of the world, all sins of the world. No greater gift has been given than what God has given. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus is the answer. He cleanses us from all unrighteousness. There's no one like Jesus. The Lord has spoken, and the Lord said, almost 2,000 years ago. He said, upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Church and it are singular, you know. The Lord only has one body, one church. That one that he looks at, that he expects to behave and do his will. The rest of them out there, they don't belong to him, but we do. That's why we must be about our Father's business. There's work to be done. Jesus died for the church, his church, the church of Christ, the only one that you're going to find in the Bible. The Bible is right. So his instruction is this. We need to hear the word. Romans chapter 10, verse 17, the Bible says, so that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We need to believe that word. Hebrews chapter 11, the verse 6, the Bible says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he to come to God must believe that he is, and that he is the reward of them that diligently seek him. We then need to repent of our sins. Luke chapter 13, the verse 3, Jesus said, I tell you, nay, except you repent, shall all likewise perish. Then we need to confess the sweet name of Jesus to be the Son of God. Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 and 33. He says, if you confess me before men, I will confess you for my Father which is in heaven. But if you deny me before men, I will deny you for my Father which is in heaven. Then you need to be baptized in water for the remission of your sins. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Peter told him, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Then we need to remain faithful unto death. Revelations, the chapters 2 and the verses 10, talks about that crown of life. Be thou faithful unto death. You see, we need to be faithful. That's what it's all about, being faithful to God. And then we roll around. That's what is necessary for one to become a child of God. But those of us who have become children of God, who have lived, lived a long time in the body that he's blessed us, go along in our lives, and perhaps we do things that we need to correct. Today is a day of correction. Every day is a day of correction. The Bible says in James chapter 5, in the verse 16, it says, Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Repent today. If it's not that and it's something else, make it right with God today. Repent. 
That is the beauty of God's word. That is the love of God. That is the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We get to repent and make it right with God again. No greater love has been shown to you and I. Repent today. Get right. Return to your first love. Serve God all the days of your life. And you'll be blessed. And then one day, one day, you and I will stand before God Almighty. And we will give an account. And when he says, well done, that good and faithful servant. Everything that we've done has been worth it. We've made it. We're with God. That's the end game. That's the goal. Make it right with God. If we can help you in any way, or you know someone is needing prayer, come as together we stand and sing the invitational song. Hundred and seventy one beautiful robes so white. Beautiful so white. Beautiful and God, the word was preached today. And um, thank you, Elder, for sounding the warning because we now know. We are still receiving um, a prayer requests uh, on the uh, prayer line, so as we see them come up, we will address them before we go to our Father in prayer. We received a note uh, from our brother Reggie Roper. Uh, he has not been feeling well uh, all this weekend and uh, he said that uh, this has been going on since this past Friday evening. Uh, discovered that he had low blood sugar and uh, now he is suffering from um, left uh, pain in his left jaw which has worsened uh, to the point that he is going to have to go see his doctor tomorrow, Lord willing. Uh, and he also mentions that our sister Cora uh, is having issues with her sinuses, so we will be addressing uh, both of these concerns momentarily. Sister Ida uh, Cobb in her card also cited uh, uh, that Reggie was, was home as well, so um, we will be praying about both of these situations uh, momentarily. We also received a prayer request from Sister Tyler. Uh, she is uh, preparing for a procedure uh, at Memorial Hospital tomorrow morning, and that is why she's not in the assembly uh, this morning. And uh, she is just asking uh, us to continue to remember her in our prayers. Our sister Jackie Kern uh, said that uh, she would 
like to thank the congregation for your prayers and your cards uh, on last week. She is tolerating uh, her medication better. And she says, I am again asking uh, for your prayers for traveling mercies to Orlando uh, to complete a project. Uh, please also keep my family and my mother in your prayers. I love you all and thank you so very much. Uh, our sister Ida, again, uh, was um, requesting prayers for Reggie, who was home, not feeling well, per Cora, and uh, also for um, Abba Rico, is that, the, is that correct? Uh, Abba Rico uh, in the Philippines, uh, who was hospitalized uh, due to a bacterial infection. Uh, she also says, thank you for your prayers for our traveling grace uh, when we uh, made our trip to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania two weeks ago. Uh, thank you for all of your prayers. And that's from our sister, Ida. I uh, have a card uh, from the Powells that say uh, we are uh, requesting prayers for Shakira's grandmother, uh, Sister Hope McKenzie, uh, in her recent breast cancer diagnosis. Uh, please pray for her medical staff, uh, along with her mental state, and for her entire family as we help her through this process. We also got another note uh, that came in from uh, Reggie that says, thank God for resting on AC's heart this morning. Uh, keep shaming the devil. That's all I'm showing, Elder. You showing anything else? Okay. Uh, let's go to our Father in prayer. <clears throat> Father, in the name of Jesus, we uh, come into your presence and we are so grateful that you and you alone can truly examine our hearts and our souls. Uh, you know what our intentions are. You know what our motives are. And so, Father, anytime we are in your presence, we know that we are standing there uh, in the bare nakedness of who and what we are. We just pray, Father, that as we uh, continue to sit and live uh, under the examination of your powerful word, uh, that we will make every effort to bring glory and honor to you by living lives of um, penitence, by making sure that we are walking as close to you uh, as we possibly can. We thank you again for uh, touching us with the finger of your love. You woke us up this morning to see a day that was not promised to us. And we are grateful to be a part uh, of uh, our experience today from the Bible class that we have enjoyed. Those uh, young ones and others who were across the breezeway this morning. And now, Father, to be in the midst of this assembly where your word has been meticulously presented. And again, what we have heard, we now know that all of us not only have been, but are particularly accountable to you for what uh, has been spoken this morning. Uh, Father, it is uh, kind of sad when people don't realize that if anybody has a testimony, it is those who are a part of the New Testament church. And the message that we have heard today, the truth that has been spoken today, the love that has been demonstrated for you and for Jesus and your word today uh, need no commentary. And so, Father, again, we know that going to heaven is a very, very serious aspiration. Uh, we know that uh, keeping our eyes on the evil one and the evil influences is very, very important as we try our best to look out for one another. And, Father, we just hope, trust, and pray that we will continue to do that uh, as the evil one has wanted uh, to trounce uh, Arlington for years. And I can see why. It's not our size, but it is the quality of the message that is presented. It's the sincerity of heart of people who want to see others go to heaven. 
And so, Father, we just pray that we will continue to keep our eyes on you and that Jesus will always be in the center of all that we say, do, and think. Father, this morning we come into your presence and we bring our brother Reggie, who, along with our sister Cora, who is wrestling with her sinuses concerns, we pray, Father, that uh, this uh, trip that he is going to have with the doctor tomorrow morning about uh, this uh, pain in his jaw uh, will be evaluated, that they will be able to uh, bring some kind of uh, sense to what is going on in his body. Father, we know that uh, he is uh, making preparation uh, to lead songs, serve as one of our song leaders, and uh, working hard to get himself together. And uh, so it's no surprise uh, that the evil one is trying his dead level best to thwart uh, this effort. And so that's why we ask you this morning with a heart of love and sincerity uh, to continue to lay out the, the groundwork for our brother to see these medical professionals who will be able to help him and uh, to do whatever is possible uh, so that uh, he will regain his much wanted health and to continue to make preparation to serve you at a greater and more effective level. Father, we also pray for our sister Cora. We have prayed for her in the past and you have heard us uh, dealing with uh, sinuses and those who unfortunately have to wrestle with this malady uh, know all too well that sometimes it can even be debilitating. So, Father, we pray for our sister this morning. We pray for her health. We pray for her strength. We just pray, Father, that you will please help her to get through uh, this season as well. Father, we bring our sister Tyler into your presence. We know that uh, she would love to have been uh, in the assembly with us this morning, along with her grandchildren. And even they look forward to being here with us. And uh, that's through the powerful example that she has been setting consistently. But Father, we know that she has um, a procedure on the horizon and uh, she is uh, not in a position to be with us today. And so we just pray that you will help her uh, mentally, emotionally, uh, as she makes preparation for that procedure in the morning and that you will please give her victory at uh, 10 a.m. Uh, at Memorial Hospital. Father, we also bring our sister Jackie Kern into your presence and she uh, is always grateful for the prayers and for the sensitivity of uh, so, mem so many members here who pray for she and Sister Hackett continually. Uh, Father, she is just so grateful uh, for the kind attention that has been shown uh, to the issues that she wrestles with and uh, we're grateful that uh, she is able to tolerate her present level of medication. Father, we also pray for our sister as she is going to be uh, doing some traveling to Orlando uh, in the coming week uh, to complete a project. We pray that you will please be, the, be with our sister uh, as she travels. Uh, that uh, traffic is, is no joke going and coming from that direction. We just pray, Father, that you will uh, give her everything that she needs to not only travel there safely, but to uh, accomplish this task that is sending her in this direction. And then when it's over, please allow her to uh, travel safely back to Jacksonville to her loved ones. Father, we also want to pray for her sons. We know that she has given us the opportunity uh, to join her in prayer uh, regarding their faithfulness and their focus uh, toward you and toward Jesus. We also, Father, want to continue to pray for Sister Hackett, uh, one of the toughest spiritual soldiers that we have at Arlington. Uh, she has been through so much and she continues to hold your hand. And so, Father, we just pray that you will continue to bless her and keep her. And uh, we are grateful that our sister uh, uh, Kern has uh, shared these things with us this morning to give her uh, the opportunity that we could join her in prayer regarding these specific things that she has mentioned. Father, we also bring our sister Ida into your presence this morning. We're grateful she too uh, is sensitive to the um, challenges that uh, Reggie and Cora are dealing with right now. And also, Father uh, Abarico, uh, that she has mentioned uh, in the Philippines, who is uh, wrestling with a bacterial infection, uh, being hospitalized, which is um, I'm sure a very discomforting thing, but we're grateful that Sister 
Uh, Ida has mentioned this uh, to us so that we can join her in prayer uh, on behalf of uh, Abarico and uh, the hospitalization and that uh, you will please help these medical professionals to find the right uh, combination of medicines and find the right combinations of therapeutics that can address the bacterial infection. And Father, she and uh, Jerry are uh, also appreciative of the prayers that were uh, offered up on their behalf when they traveled uh, to Pittsburgh a couple of weeks ago. You bless them in that direction, and then, Father, you bless them to return home safely, and we certainly are grateful for that. Father, we also join the Powells as uh, they are telling us about uh, Sister Shakira's grandmom, uh, Sister McKenzie, uh, this recent uh, breast cancer diagnosis. Uh, Father, we are grateful that we can bring situations like this before you. Uh, we know that these uh, medical staff that we have prayed for in times past and will continue to do so, we pray, Father, that you will please give them the knowledge and the wisdom and the insight uh, to help our sister uh, deal mentally, emotionally, personally, and spiritually uh, with this diagnosis along with her family. We are also grateful that the Powells have uh, trusted us with this information. And uh, Father, we now know that we have the opportunity and the privilege to add these concerns to our private prayer list. Father, as we mentioned to you before we started our Bible class, the adult Bible class this morning, we're grateful that you have blessed our brother George uh, to be with us today. So good to see him. We thank you, Father, for uh, the way that you have helped Calvin and Jackie Payne be with us as well. We know that um, the past week has been challenging for them, but uh, by your grace and mercy, they are here. Father, again, we just thank you for the way that you have blessed Jerry and Sherry Merrill, uh, bringing them through a, a challenging situation, but by your grace and mercy, uh, they uh, were here this past Wednesday. Jerry did an outstanding job. And, and again, Father, we don't ever want to take uh, these uh, positive answers to our prayers for granted. Uh, we don't ever want to think that we dare come into your presence as if uh, we are owed anything. Uh, that's why we are sensitive. That's why we try to be as reverent as we can. We try to be as respectful as we can. And we also will always express our thanksgiving and our gratitude when you say yes to us. Father, we know that uh, our brother Larry and Sister Beverly Clark are out um, celebrating their anniversary, but yet, Father, in the middle uh, of that anniversary, we know that they are grieving the loss of Brother Larry's uh, brother-in-law. And uh, so we just pray, Father, not only for Larry, we pray for his entire family uh, as they are going to have to rally around each other and support each other uh, as they move forward. Father, we are grateful for our brother Alan. Uh, it's good to see him as well. And we also especially want to thank you for the way that you have blessed Sister uh, uh, Annette Hill and uh, Jerome and, and the great uh, love that he continues to show for his mom. Uh, he's 93 years young. She has loved you for years. Uh, the way that you have blessed my mom, who just turned 91 on yesterday. Uh, you blessed uh, Sister Hackett, who is the uh, senior member of our congregation. Father, we just have so much to be thankful for, so much to be grateful for. And uh, we just pray that we will continue to live lives that will always bring glory and honor to your name. Father, we especially want to thank you uh, for the way that you have made a public spectacle of the devil today. The message that you put on Elder Sanders' heart uh, is a message that needed to be shared. It was a message that needed to be proclaimed. And we thank you, Father, that he stood in his place and spoke a kind word for Jesus. Uh, we really don't want to lose sight of how serious this message was and how serious this message is. Because again, uh, the evil one being thoroughly embarrassed this morning is going to step up his efforts to do any and everything possible uh, to try to circumvent the truth that was mentioned this morning, but he is too late. He's always too late. He's always one step behind you. And we're grateful that we can put our full weight down on your word and your promises. And so in light of this message this morning, Father, we just pray 
uh, fervently that you will continue to cover uh, Elder Sanders, that you will continue to cover Michelle and their daughters and their family as they do everything within their power to honor you through the lives that they live. Father, we um, pray that you will help us to now focus and get our attention where it should be as Dr. Naducci will help prepare our minds and our hearts to partake of the supper and to give sacrificially of our means and uh, then to look forward to our assembly uh, shortly after our break. But again, Father, we thank you for all of these hearts that have been touched, uh, seeking your wisdom and your guidance in the various situations that we always bring into your presence. And we just pray that we will resolve, continue to resolve, that we're going to love you with our heart and our soul and our mind and our strength. Father, help us to not only love you, but to do everything within our power to honor Jesus in our hearts, in our families, and in this congregation. And we offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. says for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said this is my body which is for you do this in remembrance of me in the same way he took the cup also after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing, he is to eat, eat, eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he, for he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. Let us pray for the bread. A wise and eternal heavenly Father, will mindful of the Son, lead us to Calvary. Now is the time in which we reflect upon Jesus' death on the cross. As your word says, as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we do it in remembrance of you. Help us to be mindful of the pain and the agony and all the things that took place at Calvary. Help us to consider God's love and Christ's sacrifice. Help us to consider the fact that he was mocked, he was slapped, he was sped upon, denied, and he was forsook. Help us to never lose sight of all those things. And Father, we pray that you bless this bread as well as those who partake of it. In Christ's name we pray, amen.
Let us pray for the cup. Oh, Heavenly Father, we come to you once again, turning our attention to the cross, reflecting upon the time in which the soldier pierced Jesus' side, and out came blood and water. Father, we are reminded and we understand that that blood provides forgiveness of sins, that blood purchased the church, that was innocent blood that was shed, that was the savior of this world, Christ, died for all mankind. Help us as we partake of this fruit of the vine, which represents your son's blood. Help us to consider the sacrifice and help us consider the love that was shown. And we pray that you'll bless this cup as well as those who partake of it. It is in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. As we continue to worship God in spirit and truth, we're told to give our means. Our scripture reference is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, starting in verse 1. For the Bible reads, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have directed the church of Galatia, so do you also. On the first day of every week, each one of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper, so that no collection be made when I come. Let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we know that it is you and you alone who has given us power to make gain. Now is the time in which we're able to give back to you what you so richly bestowed upon us. Help us to give with the right understanding and help us to give out of appreciation in lieu of out of obligation. Father, we know your word said that you it's more blessed to give than to receive. We also know your word teaches that you love a cheerful giver. Help us to give, help us to be cheerful, and help us to do it with the right mindset and the right attitude. Help us to give our best to you. And Father, we pray that you'll bless the funds that are collected, that those funds be used to further your cause here on earth, on, within the church. And we pray that you'll be the elders who have the oversight of these funds, that you'll allow them to disperse those funds in a way in which are worthy and acceptable to you. We pray that you'll bless this offering as well as those who give. In Christ's name we do pray, amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. 
Before we pray, we have one more uh, additional prayer request. Um, this uh, request is from, from uh, Sister Sonia Tyus. Uh, she's, uh, she says, please pray for my mom, Fedelina Jackson, and daughter, Zahara, that they have better health and recover from their illness. And also, she wants to thank us, um, Sister Tyus, for um, prayer during her surgery. So once again, she says, thank you for that. Let us pray. Dear most kind and gracious heavenly Father, once again we come humbly before you. Thank you for this day and thank you for another opportunity to come out and worship you in spirit and in truth. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that it was done in a manner that was pleasing and acceptable in your sight. At this time, as we come on behalf of Sister Tyus, we uh, want to continue to pray for her, uh, her mother, Fatalina, and also her daughter as they have uh, a better health in the upcoming days. We continue to watch over them and keep them. And also, we thank you for her as she came through her surgery, Heavenly Father, as she continues to recover. We continue to pray her uh, blessings on her, Heavenly Father, and her family. Continue to be with the Jackson family and all they uh, stand and do, and continue to help them to continue to honor and serve you in all that they do, Heavenly Father. Once again, we thank you for them. As always, once again, we thank you for Brother AC as he continues to preach your word so boldly, Heavenly Father, and continue to uh, watch over and shepherd his flock, him along with Bill. We pray for them, uh, their strength and their health as they continue to serve you, Heavenly Father, as they continue to be an example to us. Heavenly Father, help us to continue to be a faithful and loving church. Uh, and do those things that bring honor and glory to you in this community and throughout this uh, entire world, Heavenly Father. At this time, once again, we pray for uh, the snack that's been prepared, Heavenly Father, that we, uh, as we partake of it, pray for, pray for the hands that prepared it and may it bless our, our bodies and our, as well as our souls as we continue to serve you. And Heavenly Father, as we leave this place, whenever you're present, we ask that you continue to watch over us and keep us and always please forgive us of our sins. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. few announcements before we uh, step over. Uh, don't forget, once again, we want to wish a happy birthday and anniversary for the, uh, for the week of May 1st through the 7th. Um, on the 2nd, May 2nd, that's tomorrow, we have Danielle Stevens and Bryce Bryant. Um, and on the 3rd, we have a happy anniversary to Ron and Shakira Powell. And on the 7th, happy birthday to Deja Mitchell. So once again, happy birthday and anniversary to you all celebrating birthdays this week. I uh, have a call here from uh, Sister Basu. Once again, she thanks all that's in for another week of study in God's word and worshiping with us. Um, her continued prayers as always for our elders, deacons, and members. A heart's touch by the Lord's kindness can't help but be grateful. To my Arlington family, as always, I want to thank you for your prayers, calls, cards, visit, and kindness on the passing of my cousin in New York. I'm feeling better in Christian love, Sister Rosa. Also, don't forget to join us on the Beehive tomorrow on May 2nd at 6.30 p.m. Once again, those numbers are posted in the bulletin, 716-427-1360 um, with the access code 100-2423-POUND. Uh, also, um, don't forget around the Brotherhood, there's a gospel meeting starting today at the Chafee Road Church of Christ, um, where their theme is family, learning, loving, living, lasting. And the guest speaker is Brother Joe Wells. And also, uh, May 8th through the 10th is another gospel meeting at the West Side Church of Christ where their theme is Standing on the Promises of God. And their guest speaker is Brother Charles Larry from the 27th Avenue Church of Christ in Ocala, Florida. And they have a mask wearing and social distancing is required at all times. Um, also, don't forget um, before you leave out to um, deposit your uh, communion packets in the trash as you leave the, ex the building. And also, one, uh, just a Brief announcement on uh, June 8th, uh, Brother Chris will be headed to Nigeria and just going to put this on the, uh, out there right now. So uh, if you could start gathering your over-the-counter meds and reading glasses. I know we'll have a list uh, be forthcoming soon, but you kind of put you in that mindset as, as you start gathering those, uh, those items to prepare uh, for Brother Chris as he takes those over to Nigeria. So once again, June 8th, Brother Chris will be headed to Nigeria and want to kind of put those items. If you will bring those items in, I know those are the the main, main media items of so the over-counter meds and the reading glass. If you bring those, start bringing those here, we'll greatly appreciate that. Um, 
that's all the announcements I have. Lord willing, we see you back at around 1.30-ish, 1.30 for the uh, PM service. Okay, so at 1.30, we'll start our PM service. Thank you. Up here, yes, if you will please take a seat and take a hymn book. First, let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have this privilege of gathering before your holy presence as a body. We pray, Father, that you continue to help us to let your word do its work in our heart by having an open mind, keeping our eyes firmly focused on Jesus. We pray that as we prepare to worship you this afternoon, that all the offerings of our hearts, the songs from our mouth, the word that we will hear will be pleasing in thy sight. We pray your blessing and your guidance on the speaker and on every brother who is participating in these worship activities. But most importantly, we pray that you cleanse us of our sins so that our worship service will be acceptable in thy sight. And we pray it all in the name of Jesus. Amen. So we are going to sing a song, and that will bring the preacher to preach the word. And after the message, please go ahead and mark number. 406, just a closer walk with thee. The songs, by the way, I already posted on the board to my left. 406, just a closer walk with thee. That is a song of invitation. But before the message, let's notice 859, when all of God's singers get home. 8.59. Let us sing. What a song of delight in the city so bright Where we wafted neath heaven's fair dome How the ransom will raise happy songs in his praise when all of God's singers get home. When all of God's singers get home, we are never sorrow welcome. Yeah, we go. Yeah, we know. Let's fly. 
Welcome back. Appreciate so very much you taking the time out to complete our worship service for the day that we offer up to God. And we always pray that what we will offer up will be acceptable uh, to him. We thank God for that uh, crew over that um, prepared a very nice snack for us to eat, to enjoy. We appreciate their efforts. And now we want to, uh, again, close out our day uh, with another portion of God's word being shared with you. As I promised on this morning, uh, I gave uh, giving you a title that we were going to talk about on t uh, this afternoon, and that title is listed as, Is There a Mouse in the House? And uh, before I get to this lesson, uh, my wife has always told me that uh, I, I suffer from TMI, too much information that I give. Uh, and um, she said, I give, I give way too much information, personal information. It's my nature to do so. And uh, I'm going to share with you uh, yet another story. Uh, it, it involves uh, primarily Brother Bill and I. So Brother Bill, you might be able to join her after today and say, you, she's right, you give out way too much information. I grew up the first 18 years of my life, mostly in apartments, uh, accompanied by both roaches and mice. That was my upbringing. Um, though I detest both, it was the mouse that particularly annoyed me the most, I believe. It annoyed me because they were so sneaky. Uh, they did their work at night, usually. And lo and behold, if company ever came over, they would sure enough show up and show out. I detested them. In my opinion, the lowest description that can be given to any person, especially a man, is to be described as a mouse rather than a man. Sneaky, annoying, loves to show out. So for me personally to be called less than a man, you may as well call me a mouse because that's just the way I would take it and read it because all I've tried to do in my life is to be just what God has made me to be. When I was a boy, I was a boy. When I became a man, I became a man. And I try on every level to be just that, to be a man. You know, I had uh, asked for your uh, apology earlier in the lesson that I had, and I said that this, these lessons would be uh, about me. I really do try to avoid that, but it couldn't be helped on today. So I think the struggle that some people have at our congregation is that they still of the notion, of that, I believe the notion, that Brother Bill runs this church. It is blatantly false. Because if you really knew the man, as I do, you would know he's the exact opposite. I've tried to say that over and over again. I certainly have repeated that. But some choose to struggle, if they will, with that belief. So my goal um, with this lesson is hopefully to help you, anyone, uh, to see how things really are, if you're interested in knowing the truth. You see. I am not ashamed uh, of being what God has made me to be. I'm a man. And I tell, uh, in any situation, I tell myself, whatever it is, you stand up and you be a man. And if you need to be God's man, you be God's man. You speak the truth and you stand on it. So it, it, it troubles me when people struggle with things that are just not true. Uh, when you say things like, Brother Bill, run this church, 
in essence, what you're saying to me is that you are an afterthought, uh, less than what God has made you to be. Now, I told you earlier in the lesson that I had, what people say really don't bother me. But I want to help you if I can, those who struggle with that, because it really is not the case. You know, when God has made you to be what you are, then to give him anything less than that uh, is a disappointment to God. I'm not trying to brag, but I am the embodiment of a man, proven over and over again. I stand where others wouldn't stand. I watch men who I thought was even, that I thought should stand, did not, but I did. Because I'm a man. I'm a man through and through. And I, if I find something to be right, especially when it comes down to God's word, I don't care who it is. I have, I have corrected my own mother on occasion. I corrected my wife. I corrected friends, whoever it may be, or even authority. Because right is right and wrong is wrong. That's just the way I view it. And so you have to be a man. Again, I'm not bragging. I'm just trying to give you the facts so people won't struggle with the things that they struggle with. As best I can calculate, Brother Bill and I have served together as elders for about 15 years. And you know as well as I do that, they are, that we both have distinct and different personalities. It is impossible for Brother Bill and I to go through all that we did and see eye to eye on everything that we do. Impossible. But he and I both have the good sense to know what the devil would try to do with us. If he can drive a wedge between Brother Bill and I, he can do much damage in this congregation. So I've seen that man give uh, at times, not, not compromise his principles, but I've seen him give for the sake of peace uh, in this eldership. I too have given for the sake of peace in this eldership. We know what the devil would try to do. So it's a give and take that had to be, we try to do our very best to understand as much as we can, and we have worked out quite nicely. But you know, there was one incident that came up that I think the closest we came to, um, I, I, I wouldn't call it butting heads or anything like that, it was just an issue. And I'm gonna take you back to September 2020. We were at the height of the pandemic, COVID hysteria. We were some 60 days outside of a presidential election. So you know what the media was doing. Everybody was in rare form all over the place. Everybody trying to accomplish what they needed to accomplish. Well, back then in September of 2020, that's when this happened, just a week or two earlier than that, my wife had contracted uh, COVID. And we followed the protocols just as they told us to. Uh, what, you know, put her on one side, you do this. Aspen came down, if she wasn't already there, she stayed to help me with her, with her mother to nurse her back to health. We essentially had to shut down our business, even though we were deemed essential. Uh, we shut it down. We stayed away from the congregation because we didn't want to infect anybody. And that was the protocol back then. So we were isolated there uh, uh, at the home, trying to get Michelle better. I began to call, as I normally do, Sister Nell Simmons. And I called for Sister Nell, and I couldn't get Sister Nell. Remember now, this is, this is the height of COVID. Nobody had many answers. And you know, because of HIPAA, uh, people wouldn't give you information. So I called up and say, I'm trying to speak to Sister Nell. Uh, she, she's not available, whatever. Well, can I speak to her? No. Everybody was afraid of being sued. No information was given at all. And, and I kept calling, trying to get uh, Sister Nail, and couldn't get her, couldn't get her. If I'd have went out there, they stopped you at the door, they wouldn't let you in. It, 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 it was just a, 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 a terrible time. And I couldn't get her. And Sister Nail had told me some time before that, she said this to me. She said, baby boy, that's what she called me, Later found out baby boy was because, you know, she lost a son. He and I was about the same age she, to a motorcycle accident in his, in his early 20s. And she said, you would do for me, you're doing for me what he would have done for me. I believe he, he would have done that for me, what you do for me. So she called me baby boy. And uh, uh, I, I couldn't get her. And, and uh, I found out later after a call from her brother that Sister Nell had been hospitalized. 
had an infection, and when she get that, she get mixed up. She can't remember numbers. She couldn't really get me. He finally got me to tell me what happened to Sister Nail. Sister Nail's been hospitalized. Sister Nail finally got her brother to call me. And Sister Nail told me this. She said, baby boy, I, th I think I'm dying. She had instructed the doctors not to give her any more medicine and all those things. She said, I I I'm leaving. I'm leaving this place, I believe. She said, I want you to come see me, is what she said. And so uh, there I was, there with Michelle, uh, not coming to church, of course, not, going, not working the business, just there. I remember what she told me. Your face is the last face I want to see before I leave this earth. If I ever called you, come. So I made the decision. I didn't know what was going on. Sister Nell very well could be leaving this world. And the way she was speaking, she's alone. And I said, nobody at Arlington should die alone. It just shouldn't happen. So I did. I got up. When her brother told me where she was, I went there. And I knew I would be stopped, and I knew I would be questioned about COVID and everything else at the height of it. And sure enough, they stopped me outside, and they said, uh, have you uh, been, have you, do you have COVID? I said, no. She said, has anybody close to you have COVID? I said, no. I lied. Ask God to forgive me. My goal when I left there was to see Sister Nell. And I said, if these people don't stop me, I'm going to go in. So after I saw Sister Nell, we got her squared away. Uh, Lester was elder, uh, there at the time as well. Uh, one of our Monday night calls, I told Brother Bill and Lester, I said, um, I did see Sister Nell. I went to see. And uh, Brother Bill said, let me ask you a question. So when they ask you, did you have COVID, what did you say? I said, no. He said, so when they ask you, uh, have you been in contact with anybody who had COVID, what did you say? I said, no. Brother Bill said, so. Are you comfortable with uh, telling these people no breaking protocol and going to see Nell? I said, Brother Bill, you asked me a question, and I answered it. Brother Bill said, OK, well, let me understand. So you did not really, he did everything he could not to call me a liar is what he did. <laughs> so you, you really placed it upon yourself in so many words to go in knowing that you had this, you know, your wife is this, uh, had COVID and so forth. And then finally I answered Brother Bill. I said, Brother Bill, let God judge me on this one. Let God judge me. Now, you're standing on your principles and you are right. I'm wrong. I get that. I, 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 would, I would expect nothing different from him. I said, but on this one, Brother Bill, let God judge me. He will. And if I'm wrong, he'll deal with me. But what I did is what I did because I was going to see Sister Nell, and I didn't want her to die alone. That's the closest that Brother Bill and I came to an argument. You may know others, Elder. That's the closest one I can remember. And we have never repeated that. Until this day, that's, that's the next time you heard about that, isn't it? Because when you're a man, you're a man. I'm no mouse. A mouse would have, would have said to Brother Bill, I give Brother Bill whatever answer he wants, we'd have moved on. I'm a man. God judge me. No man. I may be wrong. I'm sure Brother Bill loves me enough. He prayed for me, asked God to forgive me. I'm sure he did. But no man is going to judge me. God is going to judge me. And so I said to him, so we can move on, so we can get about God's business, let God judge me on this one. And Brother Lester, i never forget, Lester sensed that there was going to be some, some you know, hard time. Our, our, our brothers, brother, let's move. Let, but. No, Lester, it's not necessary. We're good. Brother Bill stood on his principles which I expect, I stood on mine. And God is going to judge it. I'm not a mouse. I'm a man. So it bothers me when people say things like that. 
It bothers me, but it doesn't bother me. It bothers me because you're misinformed. You don't know me. I don't fear any man when God's work is, is, is needed to be done. That's just the way it is. So when I think about that, join me, if you will, at um, the book of Matthew, chapters 18. Each person has to do what they have to do. The Bible says that Matthew chapter 18, this reminded me of the situation and the role that I serve and what I'm going to have to do and the answers that I'm going to have to give. Some I'm sure will work in my favor, some won't. Lord knows I need his mercy. I need his grace. I can only do my very best. But I want to be God's man at all times. I must be God's man. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 18, starting at the 12th verse, Jesus speaking. He says, what do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, does he not leave the 99 and go to the mountains to seek the one that is straying? And if he should find it, surely I say to you, he rejoices more over that sheep than over the 99 that did not go astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. In my mind on that day, Sister Nell was alone. She was dying, and I didn't want that. What can I do? I may have been wrong. God may judge me to be wrong. But that was my mindset. I'm going to get to Sister Nell because I don't want her to die alone. She said, when I call you, come. I told her I would. And all I can do is try. This is my leaving the 99 to go get the one. And you know what, family? I'll do the same thing for you. If you need me, you can count on me because I'll be there. Love you that much. Don't know what the risk may be, what the penalty may be, but I'll come to you. And I'm not trying to kill people and everything else. That wasn't, that wasn't in my mind. My God is able. And when Michelle contracted that COVID, I was saying to myself, please, let me get this and get it out of the way. I must be about my father's business. I went to her, I'll come to you because I love you that much. The devil you see tried to create a wedge between Brother Bill and I. Again, unsuccessful because we both got the good sense to know that if we stand before God, having affected one of his sheep by our misbehavior, we both know we're going to have to give an answer to God for that. And I don't think either one of us are interested in doing that. When you read the Bible, there are times that you read about great men, even some great prophets, and you're able to pull from um, your reading and sometimes you can even see yourself. You begin to wonder, well, what am I like? And how did he react? That's kind of the same stuff that I'm made of. And as I look at the Bible many times, I think in many ways, and I'm not trying to prop myself up. I'm not trying to be anything other than what I am. But I see some similarities between me and John the Baptist. John the Baptist was fierce for the Lord. And I can say this with a true heart. I have not met many men more fierce when it comes to serving God than me. I put myself in hot spots knowingly, ready to stand and defend the gospel. You might say that I'm battle tough. I am. I'm rugged as they come. Because I believe God's word 
is the truth. And I will stand for it. And if I go down while I'm standing for God's word, I cannot leave in a better way. That's a blaze of glory to me. That's like Isaiah going up in the chariots. If I go down defending God, that's more than okay with me. But you got to be a man to do that. You can't be a mouse. And I have proven over and over again, I'm a man and not a mouse. It saddens me when people make comments like that and see and accuse me of being less than that because I say to myself, you don't know what a man looks like anymore. I don't know what you're looking at. I don't know what you're trying to fix in your mind. You can believe what you want to believe. People see what they want to see. But you're misinformed when it comes to me. I'm a man. Always have been. When I became of age, I became a man. But I've been a leader all my life. And since I was just a little something, I've been a leader. And God used that way back then. Now that I look back on it, he was shaping me, shaping me for this. I'm more than capable, more than ready. Because God has shaped me. Let me read a little bit from Matthew chapter 3, starting at the verse, uh, first verse. When I look at old John, and this is where I gain my strength. You know, like any other man, I'm like every other man. I, I, have my, I have my angst. I have my concerns. I don't go around talking about it. There's nothing, you know, I'm not afraid of anything. I never said that. But I know when I look down deep and pull from God, I do anything. John the Baptist was the same way. Old John the Baptist was in prison. Wasn't he worried a little bit? Hey, can you go find um, Jesus and ask him if he's the one, or should I be looking for another? This man was living life. This rugged man, you see, had his concerns too. So I know how it can be. But John gained his strength, and because he gained his, I gained mine when I read about him. The Bible says in verse number 1 of Matthew chapter 3, In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Verse 4. Now John himself was clothed in camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the region around Jordan went out to him, Verse 6, and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. Great success. John the Baptist is doing, his, doing the will of God, preparing the way, and people are coming to him to be baptized and confessing their sins. What a great thing to witness. The Bible says in verse number 7, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, notice John, brood of vipers, who warn you to flee from the wrath to come? John, you're already preaching. People coming, you're baptizing. Why are you calling out the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Because John the Baptist was a man. And these were in opposition to God. And he told them what they needed to hear. The Bible says in verse number 8, Therefore, bear fruit worthy of repentance. And do not think to say yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I'm going to take away that argument from you. You always claim to be Abraham's. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. God don't need you. He'll make the stones worship him. Don't tell me about Abraham being your father. Do his will. Bear fruit worthy of repentance. John the Baptist told them. The Bible goes on to say in verse number 10, And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which does not bear fruit, good fruit, is cut down and thrown into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. 
his winning fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn out the chaff with unquenchable fire. John the Baptist was a man. Thank God that I can read about John the Baptist. Thank God that I can have a pattern to follow, that I can look to God's holy word and learn how to be a man and remain a man, no matter what may come. You see, is there a mouse in the house? Not in the Lord's house. Brother Bill certainly is not a mouse, and neither am I. Church, you are in good hands, good care. You got men that will stand up to false doctrine, stand up to anything that's trying to harm you. You are in good hands, you see. I'm not selling. I'm just, I'm just stating what is factual. Because the love that we have for God is extended to God's people. To God be the glory. If you're here and you're not a child of God, we want to encourage you to become a child of God this day by obeying the gospel. The gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You come by hearing this word, Romans chapter 10, verse 17, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You need to believe that word. Hebrews chapter 11, and verse 6, the Bible says, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that come to God must believe that he is and there's the reward of them that diligently seek him. Then you need to repent of your sins. Luke chapter 13 and verse 3, Jesus said, I tell you, nay, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Then you need to confess Jesus Christ to be the Son of God. Matthew chapter 10 and verses 32 and 33 says, If you confess me before men, I'll confess you for my Father which is in heaven. But if you deny me before men, I'll deny you for my Father which is in heaven. Then we need to be baptized in water for the remission of our sins. Acts chapter 2 verse 38, Peter told him on that day, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Then we all need to remain faithful unto death. Revelation chapter 2 and verses 10. Be thou faithful unto death. Then, if you're here today and you have not walked accordingly, and you want to make it right with God, James chapter 5 verse 16 tells us to come back and pray one for another that we may be healed. The fervent righteous prayer availeth much. We can help you this day. If you're here, you know someone that's in need of prayer, why don't you come as together we stand and sing the invitation of song. Oh. 
Our scripture reference for communion is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and starting at verse 23. Well, the Bible says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the, um, in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until it comes. Therefore, whoever eats the, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing, he is, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Let us pray for the bread. O oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time in which we're able to reflect upon the death of your Son. Father, we know the bread by faith represents his body, which he freely gave. Help us to examine ourselves, to take it with clean hands and a pure heart. It is in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. Let us pray for the cup. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the cup, which represents your son's blood, which was shed at Calvary. Father, we understand we have so many benefits because of that blood. Help us to be mindful of the pain and agony that Jesus shed. When he, um, when, his, when he shed his blood, help us to partake of this fruit of the vine, which represents his blood. We pray that you will bless it and help us to take it with clean hands and a pure heart. It is in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. We also um, are told to give of our means. Our scripture reference is 1 Corinthians 16, starting in verse 1. What the Bible says, now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so do you also. On the first day of every week, each one of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper so that um, no collections be made when I come. Let us pray for the offering. Oh, Heavenly Father, we come to you as humble as we know how, Father. We know it is you and you alone who have given us the ability and blessed us with homes, jobs, and cars, and various things. Father, it is you who have made it possible for us to um, gain a positive income and to be able to take care of ourselves, Father. Father, we have an opportunity to give back to you what you so richly bestowed upon us. Father, help us to give with purpose, help us to give with understanding, help us to give cheerfully, and help us to do um, to give with the right mindset and attitude, Father. We pray you bless those who give, and, um, and, you, and we pray that the funds that are given will be utilized to further your cause here on earth. It's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. Assembly to a close by singing the first stanza of 808, K08. Abide with me. Uh -huh.
Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, once again, we come before you. Thank you for waking us up with life, health, and strength, Heavenly Father, and uh, coming once again, worship you, you in spirit and in truth, Heavenly Father, this Lord's Day. We pray, Heavenly Father, that our worship was done as in a manner that is pleasing to accept in your sight. Once again, as always, we thank you, Brother AC, as he continues to preach your word. We pray for his family as they continue to stay in, their, in your strength, Heavenly Father, as they continue to serve you and honor you with their lives, Heavenly Father. Once again, we thank you for those who, uh, folks who stayed behind and could continue to worship you this afternoon. We pray, Heavenly Father, that everything that we do be to your name's honor and glory, Heavenly Father. Now, as we leave this place, but never your presence, we ask that you continue to watch over us and keep us. And as always, please forgive us of our sins. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, just real quick, once again, want to make mention of our birthdays and anniversaries for this week of May 1st through the 7th. Uh, on the 2nd, uh, happy birthday to Danielle Stevens and Bryce Bryant. Also on the 3rd, happy anniversary to Ronnie and Shakira Powell. Um, and on the 7th, happy birthday, Sister Deja Mitchell. Um, once again, don't forget to join us on the Beehive tomorrow at 6.30 p.m. All the phone numbers and access codes are the same. With that said, be safe, Lord willing, see you on the next appointed time. Thank you.